I'm Jack Davis. Thank you, Cynthia. You really outdid yourself with that introduction. It was beautiful. Um, I and I don't want to follow it. <laughs> Sorry, I've got to get this on here for the folks who are streaming in. Thank all of you for coming out. And uh, there's so many people in this room to thank on, on many le levels. Um, and a number of you have in this room have sent me over the past few years, sent me articles or steered me toward uh, some reference to uh, bald eagles or a bald eagle. And a uh, number of you, um, uh, uh, Vicki, Mary, um, uh, Lynn, um, certainly Cynthia, and I know I'm leaving some others out who've read parts of, of the book. Uh, and offered uh, Sandy and have offered feedback and um, Justin is that you back there is that Justin back there Justin who's photographed Justin and I um, gosh it, it was only a year ago we were uh, going out to uh, Lachua Trail when it, when the water wasn't so high and Justin is a photographer and was taking these beautiful photographs of bald eagles in action uh, in engaged in aerial battles he saw a, a pair in an aerial battle and they, they swapped the fish back and forth in midair five times, uh, this fish they were fighting all the, and it was really spectacular and, and stealing fish from osprey, stealing fish from each other. And, um, and uh, uh, Julian uh, DePorto is also here. And one of his photographs uh, is, is in the book. And so there are a number of people in this room that contributed to um, to this work. Also, I, I have to thank the University of Florida who uh, enabled and uh, made it possible for me to have two years off to work on this book. Uh, President Fox is, is here nominated me for a Con Carnegie Fellowship, uh, which funded uh, a full year leave from the university, which was um, really a, a rare privilege in more ways than one is right in the middle, right when COVID struck. Uh, so I didn't have to deal with all the well, what my colleagues were dealing with in the classroom, and then the university followed that with a uh, uh, one-year sabbatical. So people ask me, "This one came out fast," they say, and that's because I had two years of writing time and uh, undisturbed for the most part. So, and of course, it's just a treat to be here at Matheson. It always is. I've given so many talks here uh, on a uh, number of books. We launched the golf, uh, the golf here in 2017, and um, you know the, the the size of the audience was was the same as this, and um, so uh, many of you were here then too. So anyway, thank you for coming out. So such a beautiful day. I don't know why you are inside uh, hanging out with me, but uh, and also afterward, there are. Fantastic refreshments out in front of the Matheson house. Um, a number of people made eagle cookies. <laughs> they are beautiful. My daughter Willa and her friend Maggie were up uh, uh, late last night uh, uh, making a um, hundred and some odd eagle cookies. Cynthia made eagle cookies. Sandy okay. made eagle cookies. And, and uh, uh, so many of my friends, Lynn and Mary, and, Heather and others contributed food also. So there's a lot. Only thing I did was go out and buy cups. <laughs> no, my daughter bought those. <laughs> Thank you, Willa, for all that. Kind of laughing too. <laughs> Thanks for putting up with me. So let me talk. Let me finally talk about the bald eagle. Let me, let me talk about, let's tell you why uh, I, I wrote this book. 
I there are a couple of reasons I, I, I decided to write about the bald eagle. One, um, the last cultural history of the bald eagle was written in 1996, and it really focuses on the restoration period after DDT. It doesn't go deeply into the history. It's a very good book by Bruce Beams uh, titled um, Eagle's Plume. And before that, uh, another book, uh, Cultural Social History of the Political History of the Bald Eagle, that was written, was written by a Floridian, by the way, in, published in 1963. Polly Redford was her name. She was a South Floridian, wonderful writer, and uh, a book titled Raccoon and Eagle, 1963. So why is, that's a pivotal year in the history of the Bald Eagle. Does anybody know why? DDT. We'll say more now. DDT lasts from 1945 to 1972, at least on the market. Why is 63 significant? That that's a particular year. The name year, yes. That was the year in which the bald eagle nest in the lower 48 had plummeted to fewer than 500. Now let me put that in perspective for you. When the uh, when the when Europeans settled North America, the estimated bald eagle population in North America uh, North America was 500,000. Uh, and so the lower 48 has only 487 nesting pairs. And, and they're not very successful nests because of DDT, exactly right. Uh, and today, the bald eagle population continent-wide is probably 500,000 once again. Phenomenal comeback story. Uh, so I saw a need to write this cultural, an updated cultural natural history of the bald eagle um, but I also wanted to tell the story of the bald eagle's successful comeback. And we hear about it, um, but I wanted to offer, I wanted, I wanted readers to know exactly how it happened. And uh, it's part in part attributable to bald eagles and their steadfast uh, domestic instincts. Uh, as Cynthia suggested, they are phenomenal. They have phenomenal family values. Uh, the the, the uh, a pair of mates for life. Uh, they will return to their same nest uh, uh, every year as long as that nest exists. If it doesn't, a nest can last 30, 40 years as long as a tree can hold it. And um, the and that nest gets bigger every year because, as Cynthia suggested, uh, and making her remark about home builders, they refurbish their nest every year and they add on to it. And so it gets heavier. One nest that I write about in the book um, was estimated to weigh two tons. And so, and finally the tree that was holding it said no more and, <laughs> and, and, and collapsed. So, and they raised their young with such care that when they leave the when they leave their breeding territory at around between 16 and 20 weeks, they uh, often weigh more than their parents. Um, and so, um, so that comeback is in part attributable to bald eagles, but also to us. Uh, I see 1972, the year that we, uh, the EPA banned DDT, very brave move by the, uh, on the part of William Ruckel's house. And uh, also the year that Congress with strong decisive bipartisan support, um, passed the Clean Water Act, then overrode it within a few hours, President Nixon's veto, a veto that surprised some people because he has a very good environmental record. And, and that clean, without that Clean Water Act, cleaning up our waters, the habitat of bald eagles who feed primarily on fish, that bald eagle would not have been able to make, make its comeback. Um, but th that's the only, that's only the, the first redemption in our relationship, or the only one of the two redemptions in our relationship with the bald eagle. We redeemed ourselves in our relationship with the bald eagle earlier in the century, in 1940, when Congress passed the Bald Eagle Protection Act. Um, and it was a different story leading to the bald eagle's near extinction in lower 48 in the, uh, by the late 19th century. Um, which I'm going to tell you about in just a minute. Uh, DDT 
um, impact on bald eagles and other birds, osprey too, by the way, they're disappearing uh, throughout this period. All raptors, all fishing raptors are disappearing at, at this time. And, uh, but in that particular instance, um, uh, they were co collateral, collateral damage. They were unintended targets of DDT. And, but, um, but the first time we pushed, uh, the, the bald eagles had its brush with extinction. Uh, we um, directed a, an assault uh, uh, against the bald eagle, an intended assault, which I'll talk about in a minute. But I wanna, wanna shift back in time a little bit, shift back to the very beginning of, of the United States and talk about the great seal of the United States. And I wanna ask you a, a couple of questions. Where does Franklin fit into the history of the bald eagle and the great seal of the United States and uh, uh, a the, uh, the national bird? And if you've read the book, don't, don't, <laughs> no, no, don't, yeah, don't give away the answer. He wanted the turkey. He wanted the turkey. Yes, that's uh, that's what's commonly believed that he wanted the turkey. He favored the turkey. He compared the. The, the, the morality, as he said, uh, of the two birds, the bald eagle with the turkey. And he said that he, Ben Franklin said that the bald eagle was a, uh, was a rank coward and thief. Um, <laughs> and the, 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 the turkey was a more noble bird, an honest bird. Um, and the, um, and that's, that's true. He wrote those, wrote about the bald eagle, um, wrote a comparison of the two in a letter to his daughter, Sarah Bach, in 1784. And uh, two years after Congress adopted the, the Great Seal, and he did say to Sarah that I do, that he wished that the bald eagle had not been chosen as his, as his country's representative. That's his exact words, country representative. Um, uh, however, he never advocated the turkey for the position of national bird or to be on the great seal in the United States. Um, Franklin had, a, he was on the Congress's first seal committee, the first committee appointed Jefferson, Adams, Franklin, stellar cast, right? You think this is right after, this is moments after Congress's votes, votes to uh, adopt the uh, Declaration of Independence and these three guys uh, were uh, uh, appointed to this committee to come up with a design for a great seal. They fa failed miserably, a seal, you know, a national seal. It was just a horrifying failure. Um, and you will not believe what Franklin wanted on the great seal. And I'm not gonna tell you because you're gonna have to read it. <laughs> but it will blow your mind. Because it did mine. I didn't know until I started researching uh, this book. And so, and but the other myth is uh, that we don't have a national bird. Congress has never anointed a bird as national bird, as it has uh, 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 anointed a national mammal, the bison, uh, a national tree, the oak, a national flower. The flower tomorrow, Congress, if it uh, saw fit, uh, could actually uh, designate uh, any bird as national bird, including the sidewalk pigeon. Uh, but and that, of course, would be a shame. Um, but the uh, the bald eagle was put on the front of the, the great seal of the United States, uh, and the and nations had coats of arms and seals. These, these, these were their ID badges, if you will, on the international scene. And uh, it took Congress six years, almost as long as it took America to win the revolution, it took Congress six years to come up with a great seal that everybody could agree on. And it was Charles Thompson, who was the president, uh, excuse me, the secretary of the Continental Congress, who finally said, oh my God, you got, you're just failing, you idiots. Uh, uh, we need a great. We're about to. We're about to go to the uh, Paris to sign a peace treaty with the, the the British, and we don't have a seal. We don't have a national seal to stamp on the parchment. 
Uh, so he said, so he came up with the idea of putting the bald eagle on the front of the great seal of the United States. Now, uh, in heraldry, eagles have been very popular dating back to the ancients, back in ancient Greeks and, and Romans, uh, on national seals, uh, um, on, on lots of important documents and in, in, insignia. Uh, but those are not ornithological eagles. They're just mostly, in most cases, black eagles that, that uh, don't belong to any particular species. And so uh, the, the bald eagle was the first identifiable eagle species to go on the seal of a nation. Uh, and Thompson insisted that the bird be an American bald eagle. Uh, and he could not have picked a better bird in my uh, uh, in my belief, for a couple of reasons. One, the bald eagle lives only in North America. It's truly an all-American bird. Uh, and two, look at a bald eagle. It's this bird that is just, it's just, it exudes charisma, doesn't it? It's handsome. It's, um, it's powerful looking. It's large. Uh, it's easily identifiable. And when you look at the expression on a bald, that permanent expression on a bald eagle, because of that suborbital uh, bone or ridge above its eye, it has that permanent, as I say in the book, don't tread on me stare. <laughs> you know, it's perfect. You know, it conveys courage and strength uh, and, and, uh, and unity. And uh, the, uh, the, founders, the founders knew that and they, they picked the right bird. And before the great seal was adopted in 1782, the bald eagle wasn't really a very popular symbol. I mean, people, you know, not that anybody disliked it, but you didn't find it on uh, on, on a lot of uh, um, uh, calling business cards and, and, and signs and and um, uh, uh, creamware, if you will. And not it, it was rarely it rarely appeared in the decorative arts. Um, but once the bald eagle was adopted for the Great Seal, it was its image became an instant hit. It's appearing on everything in popular culture and of course in national culture as well. Um, however, at the same time, while Americans embraced their image and loved it, it just became increasingly popular through the 19th and 20th century. Uh, and I mean, look at it today, it's everywhere. Uh, and you know, it's on our tires, on the back of motorcycle jackets. There used to be a really lousy AMC Eagle, Eagle that, you know, uh, who, who, anybody in here ever own an AMC Eagle? You're, you're, you're smart, you are smart people. I, think you are. <laughs> I suspected you were smart. Uh, and that was a car that did not live up to its name. <laughs> and uh, it's the most popular animal mascot for sports teams. Um, and so, and it's also, by the way, uh, eagle nest cams are the most popular uh, wildlife camps in the world. But, but I'm, I wanna, so while the symbol itself was hugely popular, the species, the, the, the feather and blood bird was not, the living species was not. Um, it's it's an apex predator and Americans treated early on and throughout the 19th and on into, well into the 20th century, treated the bald eagle like they did any other predator, a wolf, a coyote, uh, a mountain lion, a bear. And what did we do with predators? Kill them. Kill them. Yes, you, you needed to eradicate them. And the bald eagle was very much on the hit list. Uh, a bald eagle scene was a bald eagle to be shot. Uh, it was seen as one's civic duty uh, if a bald eagle flew over uh, to, to kill it, to go grab the gun uh, and kill it. Uh, and, 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 and Americans did that. I did a, a uh, search on uh, newspapers.com from 1850 to uh, 1920. And I searched the three words, bald eagle shot in quotation marks. And I got over 140,000 hits. And um, so, and the reason why they, were targeted as other predators were is because they were accused of all sorts of crimes. Remember Franklin said it was a rank coward and thief. Uh, of course he was complaining because it stole from the osprey, which it does. Um, and science has since learned that animals that steal from food from other animals is smart behavior. 
Uh, and so, but, uh, but they also were accused of stealing all sorts of livestock, uh, flying away with calves and pigs and sheep and chickens, chickens they can carry away. One uh, um, uh, livestock uh, farmer up in Georgia who I interviewed for the book uh, referred to chickens. He went into the free range chicken business and all of a sudden in the wintertime, bald eagles just converged on his, his ranch. Um, and uh, they've stolen, over the years, they've stolen thousands of, of chickens from him. He calls chickens low-hanging fruit. Um, and, but chickens don't weigh that much. Uh, and a bald eagle, a large bald eagle at best, with momentum behind it, uh, can snatch away perhaps something that weighs five pounds. And uh, needless to say, it can't do what T. Gilbert Pearson, who was head of uh, president of uh, National Audubon in early early 20th century for uh, uh, two or two almost three decades, and who was from Archer, by the way, they couldn't do what he accused them of doing, and he he maintained he knew of an eagle that had carried away a sheep twice its weight and flew with it for five miles. <laughs> And so ornithologists are making these claims too. John James Audubon is making these claims. Um, my whole opinion of John, John, John James Audubon changed dramatically when I wrote this book, and I'm not gonna tell you why. Um, you'll have to read. <laughs> and, but then this is the thing I love. Well, I, do, I, do, I love it, I don't love, but it's part of that paradox. It's a really interesting part of the paradox. The bald eagle was also, Mothers, on into the 20th century, mothers were warned, don't leave your infants out, uh, outside unattended, uh, lest a bald eagle fly away with it, take it back to its nest. Uh, and the McGuffey's Reader, which was the, uh, next to the Bible, was the most read book in the 19th century, uh, a primer for uh, immigrants wanting to learn English and, and school children, had a story about a, a child, that a girl that was stolen away by a bald eagle and taken back to its nest. And there's a drawing that accompanies, an illustration that accompanies this story uh, of the girl in the talons of the eagle in the air. And this girl must be seven years old. <laughs> I'm serious, you can, look, you can Google it. You can Google book it. And, uh, uh, but also in 1908, uh, Edison Studios, Thomas Edison, uh, uh, made a silent film titled uh, a Rescue from uh, an Eagle's Nest. And in this silent film, a lumberjack and his wife and daughter live out in the woods in a cabin. Uh, he, it opens up with him kissing his, his wife goodbye, his wife and child goodbye as he you know, skips off with his, his, uh, uh, his ax on his shoulder. And the mother leaves the baby outside and walks back into the cabin. And you can, it, this is this is a class, you know, we think these suspense moments started with Alfred Hitchcock, no. It started with this film. And um, so you know what's gonna happen. You know, you know, and you can hear the organ, you know, in the, in the theater. Uh, and uh, this eagle comes flying around the corner on wires. <laughs> And you can see this film on YouTube, by the way. Uh, and snatches up the baby and carries it away. And of course, the mother freaks out. Um, and uh, she and um, she almost shoots the bald eagle. Uh, and she shoots the eagle out of the sky. Changes her mind at the last minute, realizing what that would mean for a child. Uh, and she uh, finds her husband out in the woods, and he uh, ultimately rescues the uh, the child from the eagle's nest, which is on this uh, side of a cliff. Um, um, a, a, a club appears, the special effects in this movie are fantastic. A club appears out of nowhere. I mean, literally, from one frame to the other, suddenly he's got a club in his hand and, and he clubs a bald eagle and then he kicks it off the ledge uh, and he's triumphant and he rescues his daughter. The person who played the lumberjack, the star of the film, was D.W. Griffith. Oh. And you guys know he was. He was the one who made the movie, the director of The Birth of a Nation, which res resurrected the Ku Klux Klan. 
um, uh, in the in the twentieth century, and the the critics uh, uh, the critics who reviewed Rescue from an Eagle's Nest panned him or his acting, um, and uh, and he got out of acting and went into directing. Wow. It's too bad the critics were so hard on him. <laughs> um, but in any case, by the early 20th century, the bald eagle, by the late 19th century, the bald eagle is on the brink of extinction. It's, it's, it's missing from uh, numerous states across the country where it had been plentiful. Uh, and uh, particularly, it, it was so rare to see a bald eagle in, in, in the eastern seaboard states that people thought that the bald eagle was a, was a, a Rocky Mountain bird. Uh, and, uh, uh, but when Philadelphia was settled, um, uh, there was an eagle's nest on Delaware River probably every mile to uh, two miles. Uh, that's how uh, dense the population was on the East Coast. But in the early 20th century, people are realizing, many Americans realize the bald eagle is at risk of going the way of the passenger pigeon, which goes extinct. The last one dies in 1914. Carolina parakeet, last one dies in 1918. Both of them in the Cincinnati Zoo. Thank goodness they didn't have a bald eagle in that zoo. Uh, it might have gone, might have been the last one too. And so they rose up, and many people came forward and um, uh, uh, pushed the National Audubon to try to do something about this. And National Audubon under T. Gilbert Pearson's leadership would not take a stand to try to protect the bald eagle. And in 1917, the territory of Alaska adopted uh, an, a bald eagle bounty. Uh, and ultimately, which, uh, which lasted until 1952, from 1917 to 1952, and ultimately, the territory paid bounties on 128, more than 128,000 bald eagles. And you had to, to get your bounty, you had to turn in severed talons. Um, and so, uh, and the National, National Audubon would not take a stand against that either. So this fantastic woman, there are a number of heroes in, 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 in this story, um, and a number of them are women. Uh, this fantastic woman, Rosalie Edge, who was a member of National uh, of Audubon um, was was disturbed by this, and uh, Audubon wouldn't do anything. So she started her own group, title uh, which she which she named the Emergency Emergency Conservation Committee, and she found that group in direct opposition to National Audubon, uh, and her group lobbied and as did others for uh, Congress to pass. Uh, some sort of protection for the bald eagle, which it did in, again, as I mentioned earlier, 1940 with the Bald Eagle Protection Act, uh, making it a criminal offense, a federal offense. Um, one could be subjected to um, criminal fines and jail time for harming a, a bald eagle. And uh, Americans recognize, Congress recognizes, actually in legislation, that it would be duplicitous, that would be dishonest, that would be disgraceful if the symbol behind, or if the bird, the living bird behind this great symbol that was known around the world in a year, that symbol would go to war against fascist tyranny, um, that um, it, would, uh, it would diminish the integrity of the, that symbol if the bald eagle were lost, the, the living bird. But then five years later, DDT is released on the market. And we, we've talked about that already, but there are a number of heroes that emerged then too. Uh, and after DDT was banned in 1972, uh, US Fish and Wildlife with, uh, in partnership with uh, wildlife, uh, state wildlife officials launched uh, bald eagle restoration programs across the country. Uh, and that were a phenomenal success. And so the bald eagle went on the endangered species list in 1974 the Endangered Species Act was passed in 73. It was one of the first to go on the list. By 1999, because of these restoration programs, I'm gonna tell you about one um, here in Florida in just a minute, and then I'm, um, I'll be wrapping up after that. But the uh, bald eagle, because of these restoration programs, but also because of its steadfast domestic instincts, 
uh, was ready to come off the endangered species list in 1999, um, but uh, uh, bureaucratic delays in, in, in Washington delayed delisting until 2007, when the nesting population across the country was between 10 and 11,000 across the lower 48. Remember, it had been down to fewer than 500 in 1963. And so one, uh, let me tell you what, what they typically did in states outside of the South New England, New England, only Maine, Maine was the only New England state that had nesting bald eagles in 1970. Um, and so to repopulate New England, they, uh, Fish and Wildlife and, and Wildlife Authorities at the state level uh, started hacking programs. So you would take eaglets out of nests in healthy states like Michigan or Minnesota, Alaska, Canada, which is, I, I think is a country. Um, we, we, I have a good friend in here who's a Canadian, a couple of good friends here are Canadian, so I had to throw that in there. And, uh, and they would take these uh, eaglets out of nests, take one eaglet out of nests, leave one behind, and move them to states that needed eagles, and raise them in these big giant lion cages outdoors on top of stilts called hack boxes, and um, in makeshift nests. And when they were 12, and they would, in that, those boxes, they would imprint on the territory. And that would become their native territory. And bald eagles return to their native ter territories when, uh, when they reach breeding age to build their own nests. Um, and, it was a, and it worked. It worked beautifully. Uh, and except in the South, Alabama, Mississippi, uh, North Carolina, um, South Carolina, Georgia were without bald eagles. Uh, and uh, Oklahoma, and uh, uh, you weren't, um, the Fish and Wildlife was not able to bring bald eagles from Michigan down to the southern states uh, because it's too hot for the northern bald eagles. They're of a different gene pool, they're larger, uh, and they're not adapted to uh, a, a particular avian malaria. Uh, and so when they tried relocating eaglets from the north down to southern states, they died. Florida had a fairly healthy eagle population, and uh, they had 88 nesting eagles in 1970. There, it, it, before DDT, there had been uh, about 1,500 to 2,000 nesting eagles, and nesting pairs in, in, in Florida. So it suffered because of DDT also, but still it had a healthier population than the other southern states, but not healthy enough to actually take eaglets. So the University of Florida uh, stepped in with Fish and Wildlife, um, uh, Florida Game and Fish, and launched in the Sutton Center in Oklahoma, Sutton uh, Avian Center in Oklahoma, and launched an egg translocation program. And they would take eggs out of Eagle's Florida Eagle Nest, uh, transport them up to Oklahoma, hatch them under hens, raise them until they're five weeks old, and then move them into hack boxes in Alabama and Mississippi and other places. And ultimately the bald eagles here in the six county area where we are now, mostly Latcher County bald eagles, a number of them around Cross Creek. In the 1980s in a four year period, um, uh, donated 275 eggs to repopulating the other Southern states with a 100% success rate in hatching. And the bald eagles in Florida did not lose population because wildlife officials removed both eggs, or usually two eggs, uh, early, soon after they were laid. Uh, and so, when, and, and as a, and in response to that, the female would lay a second clutch. And so the population didn't decline in Florida. Uh, and uh, so, and I was fortunate enough to be able to interview the, the professor, Mike Colopy from UF. You know Mike? You knew Mike? I'm now on um, one of those trips for Reed, of course. Oh, you did? Then, did I, you know, you knew Petra Wood then too? I did. Yes. I wrote a story about it for the thing. So, wow. Oh my gosh, I didn't see that. 5,000 years ago. <laughs> I, 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 I interviewed Petra Wood, who was a graduate assistant who would go up in the helicopters uh, with, uh, uh, with Game in Florida Game and Fish 
um, and trying to hold her lunch down, as she said. And, um, and, and Mike headed up the program. Uh, he was, uh, was head of, uh, it was called it was something wildlife in those days. I can't remember what it was. And I was fortunate enough to interview both of them and some um, Florida game and fish folks. Um, and uh, to, to learn, I knew nothing about any of this. And I have to share this. So uh, Chris Browse, uh, um, Speaker of the House, Florida House, who, who I know, I was I had a conversation with him about a month or so ago. And I said, I, and I told him this story uh, about these heroic Florida eagles. And I said, Chris, when the book comes out, I'm coming to you because I want a monument to go on 441 out in front of Payne's Prairie Preserve to uh, honor these heroic bald eagles. A week later, one of his deputy chiefs of staff emailed me, asked me to tell him more about this egg relocation program in the Florida Eagles uh, because um, uh, Speaker Sprouls was including a line in this year's budget uh, for a monument. Um, so I hope that happens. And I was uh, had a conversation with a good friend of mine yesterday who was, uh, spoke to the speaker recently, had a meeting with him, and he said he wouldn't shut up about the bald eagles of Florida. <laughs> and he said, I, you know, said, we're going to put a monument in front of the Payne Prairie. So I, I hope that really happens. Uh, so, I want to I want to conclude by reading you a few paragraphs, give you a flavor of the book. And this is another. This is a human Florida hero. Oh, right here, human Florida hero. Doris Magger. How many of you guys knew Doris Magger? I had this marked recently. <clears throat> Bulging out from between the upper branches of a loblolly pine, a large finger lapped arrangement of sticks formed the familiar aesthetic of an industrious eagle couple. For some unknown, unknown reason, the pair had not returned for the 1979 nesting season. Staring up, Doris Magger was aware of the centrality of nests in the lives of bald eagles. Those compositions of meticulous labor, enigmas of an in intricacy and strength that marry art and utility are essential to the renewal of life. The identity of few birds is as closely attached to their nest as the bald eagles to its. None in North America build larger or stouter ones. The balds are emblematic of their species resilience. Nests have been a key, nests have been a key variable in determining the the, the population's decline, and they would be imperative to its revival. Without them, Magger knew, there would be no birds. Magger was also aware of the violent, spontaneous weather that frequented central Florida. And at that moment, dark clouds filled the sky to the west. Standing at the foot of the loblolly, one hand hesitantly on a climbing ladder, hanging down from the height of a fire lookout tower, she was intent on spending time in the, in the nativity of the former occupants. Manger had never scaled a tree before, much less in a storm. She reached over and touched an ominous looking lightning scar running down the tree's trunk to the ground. Pushing ahead of the storm, the wind pulsed and the green needles trembled in the branches high above. One eyewitness described the tree as spindly Another called it wind whip. Jeff Klinkenberg, a lot of you guys know Jeff. Jeff Klinkenberg, the outdoor editor of the St. Petersburg Times in the, <clears throat> is the one who used the word spindly. Here she was, he reflected decades later, 53 years old and climbing a ladder I would not have dared to climb at my age then, 30. Before putting herself at the mercy of the swelling wind, Magger tied a red bandana around her head of silver hair, which she had, had cut and styled in a new hairdo for the occasion. Owl earrings dangled beside her cheeks, and retaining the raptor theme, a spread eagle necklace wreathed her neck. 
She wore black jeans, a denim shirt, and gray running shoes. Yet her jogging routine had been inconsistent of late. In relating that detail, she confessed to Klinkenberg, I've got fat little legs, and I probably shouldn't be that far off the ground at my age. She slipped into a safety harness secured to an upper branch. Alongside the harness line, the grounding cable of a lightning rod chased down the side of the tree. A number of precautions had been taken that day, and Magger added one of her own by swallowing a motion sickness pill. I get, I get air sick and I get seasick, she again confessed to Klinkenberg, and I'm probably going to get nest sick. <laughs> Magger put one foot up on a lower rung and followed that with the other on the next rung. Grabbing a third at eye level with both hands, she stared nervously into the tree's rust-colored scaly bark and coaxed herself up toward a 50-foot summit. Whenever the wind kicked up, the tree creaked like an old door. When it swung like one, she would pause, grip the ladder tighter, and take a deep breath. She shouted to a, she shouted to a friend below, get down on your knees, Viola, and pray. <laughs> so Doris Magger was climbing this tree to live in that nest for six days uh, and to bring attention to the plight of the bald eagles. And this is 1979, but also to raise uh, to raise money for a uh, a, a raptor um, uh, aviary at Florida Audubon Society. She was a, a vice president of Florida Audubon. She started raptor rehabilitation at Florida Audubon in the 1960s in the in her own backyard. Uh, and she succeed. She she drew national attention, not surprisingly. Um, and she was in Life magazine, all, all sorts of magazines and newspapers. She was um, on Paul Harvey. <laughs> and um, so, or I should say Paul Harvey talked about her. And, uh, and she succeeded, but she devoted her life to, uh, uh, she dedicated her life to uh, protecting raptors, giving, traveling around the country, giving lectures about the importance of bald eagles and and owls and hawks and other raptors uh, to the ecosystem. Uh, at age 60, she biked across the country from uh, California to Florida, sponsored by Kmart, giving lectures, giving lectures in Kmart parking lots along the way, but also in schools. She continued to, I interviewed her a couple of years ago when she was in her mid nineties. And this is, and she said, when COVID is over, I'm getting back out there. She was insistent getting back out there in the schools. Uh, she wore out something like three Chevy vans. She drove so many miles and she always took a, a bald eagle and usually an owl, a bald eagle either named George Patton or George, uh, George Washington and an owl named um, E.T. for extra terrific. <laughs> um, so she's another one of those who helped along with the bald eagle restore the, um, the, its population. So why don't I stop there and take any questions you might have. Yes, John. Do, um, if one of the major bear passes away, do they ever seek another? Yes, immediately. They do it very, they do it very quickly, yes. And um, they, um, and unfortunately, that 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 does happen. Uh, they often lose one often. But the, the other thing that happens is not only uh, does it mate. So at the end of the breeding season, the juveniles leave first. And once they go, the parents go. But the female goes her way, the male goes his way. And then they'll show they'll return to the, the, the same nest the next year together. Uh, if one doesn't show up, uh, the survivor will go off and find somebody. Um, the um, uh, so uh, again, they're uh, they're they're loyal to their species as much as they are to um, to to each other. Yeah. Yes. What are some threats to the bald eagle? So there there are, are, are still a number of um, uh, threats to the bald eagle. Car strikes. You know, as a, as its population expands and ours does too, they're obviously going to be uh, in, in increasing. Um, confrontations between the two. 
And uh, so car strikes are uh, increasingly common, air strikes. The uh, wind turbines are a danger, but the, things are getting better there. The, the, um, the industry has really uh, risen to the occasion and uh, begun to, for several years now, have been exper experimenting with technology, including artificial intelligence technology to uh, detect when birds are in the area of a wind site. The industry, by the way, doesn't like the term wind farm. And, um, and uh, to stop the blades or slow them down. And uh, they've had uh, really great success in reducing the bald, eagle, uh, bald and golden eagle death around wind farms. And, uh, but the, the greatest threat to bald eagles is, is lead poisoning from hunting. And uh, when um, a, you know, when, when hunters shoot a deer or an elk, uh, they generally gut it out in the woods and, and leave a, a gut pile behind for the wildlife that, you know, hunters are some of our best conservationists. Uh, this is, and, uh, uh, but bald eagles are scavengers. Uh, another thing that uh, Franklin claimed he didn't like about them. Uh, and in fact, if you ever want to see a bald eagle, the, the, uh, the place where you're assured to see one is at the town dump, is that at a landfill. I'm not exaggerating. Uh, that's true. So they, they're scavengers, and you know when a lead shot or bullet hits wildlife, it tends to shatter. And so uh, a shard the size of, the, of a grain of of rice can kill a bald eagle. And um, so there there have been the Obama Obama administration um, near the end of its term banned. Uh, lead shot and bullets in national wildlife refuges. And one of the first things that um, the next administration secretary of the interior did was, uh, was uh, roll back that ban. And, uh, and as far as I know, the, the Biden administration has not reinstituted the ban. And, uh, but there, there's hope that'll happen. Yes. Heather. Can you uh, describe some of the uh, aerobatics that eagles do? I have read that it's that sort of lock talent and tumble thing is mm. primarily mating, but I've recently read it sometimes has other purposes too. Well, as Justin is witness, uh, they are fantastic flyers. And so when they're in, in, in the air in battle with another, um, uh, another eagle over a fish, They'll do all those kind of aerobatics too. Uh, and um, Walt Whitman wrote a really, what I think is a, a wonderful poem, Dalliums of the Eagles, in which he talks about the mating ritual that Heather's talking about of, of bald eagles. And they, um, they, do all, they do barrel rolls, uh, they'll do steep dives and then swoop up uh, just before hitting the ground or the water. Uh, they will lock talons and they'll do somersaults in the air and they'll fall together. And again, just before they hit the ground, they'll part uh, and fly, uh, fly up again. Uh, and so they're really spectacular. They, they're a, 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 a really uh, skilled soaring bird, uh, uh, not quite like the albatross because their wingspan isn't as long. Their wingspan is a bit, uh, bit shorter, but that allows them maneuverability like a jet plane. Uh, and they can do all sorts of things in, in the air. Um, and if, if La Chua Trail, you know, opens up again past the boardwalk, if the water drains, uh, uh, drops in, in Paintsbury, and we can get back out on La Chua Trail, you, uh, during the winter time, when there are lots of bald eagles in there, we have what, I think around 12, 13, active nest around uh, Noonan's Lake. Uh, they're, they're all over the place here. And um, so once the trail is open again, you'll be able to really witness some yeah. uh, wonder sights. Any other questions? Yes, Aaron. Can you just say a word about uh, Native Americans and how they view people? Yes, and thank you for asking me uh, to do that. Uh, Native peoples have a, a long, Native cultures have a long relationship uh, dating back thousands of years with, with bald eagles. 
For many native cultures, bald eagles are spirit birds, they're messengers uh, between uh, uh, the, the uh, living people and their ancestors, their past ancestors and, and, and the creator. They're a high flying bird, not the highest flying bird, cranes fly higher and, um, and, and so do other birds, but they, they can, bald eagles would probably reach 10,000 feet. And um, so they're birds that, they're birds of heaven, uh, if you will. And their feathers are extremely important. They, uh, they, can, uh, they are conduits uh, uh, to uh, the, the spirit world. And so uh, when we passed, when Congress passed the 1940 Bald Eagle Protection Act, making it a cr uh, federal crime to harm a bald eagle, it exempted Alaska. So Alaska could continue its bounty on bald eagles, but it ended up criminalizing traditional native uh, behavior because um, native peoples, they, some, um, some native uh, peoples or societies would kill bald eagles in very limited numbers with elaborate rituals around the killing uh, to obtain feathers and eagle parts for their, their rituals and their ceremonies. Uh, some the Zuni would just take an eaglet out of a nest and raise it in a stockade and, and, and uh, gather the, the molded feathers or, or pluck the bird. Um, but with the Bald Eagle Protection Act, that was all outlawed. And, but today, the Fish and Wildlife is starting to allow some native groups to kill a certain number of bald eagles and also to establish their own aviaries where they'll raise uh, injured eagles, uh, re uh, rehabilitate them and, uh, and, and keep them uh, so they can collect their feathers. Uh, also, there is a National Eagle Repository, I should tell you this, uh, National Eagle Repository outside of Denver. It's unlawful for you to have a bald eagle feather. If you find one on the ground, you, the law requires you to re, uh, turn it into the authorities. Uh, or if you, if you see a car strike a bald eagle and kill it, you can't take that bald eagle home. You have to turn that bald eagle in or let the authorities know about it. Because all the dead eagles are, the bald eagles are sent to the National Eagle Repository outside of Denver, where they are processed uh, so that their feathers and uh, body parts go to native uh, uh, the native peoples, not not actually the tribes themselves, but in, in individuals who apply for feathers or talons or or a head or w whatever, and uh, and so that repository is um, virtually exclusively for for native peoples. Um, uh, sometimes some of those parts will go to uh, science, scientific research, but the vast majority go to native uh, uh, applicants. Yes, Caitlin. I have a question from Zoom. Um, is it true if there are eaglets in the nest and one parent dies, the mate could potentially starve to death because it gives all prey to the chicks? Yes, and in fact, um, there's often competition between the, the two chicks and uh, nest watchers have called this baby bonking. Uh, whereas a, a healthier chick will muscle out the, the weaker one and sometimes even kill uh, the weaker one. And parents have been known to eat that, uh, that the, the, the dead chick. <laughs> so that's the caveat. If you, if you decide you want to, oh, let's break for uh, tr uh, snacks now. Um, <laughs> Now that's a caveat if you want to, uh, you know, tune into an eagle cam, you may see some violence there. And it's really interesting what happened to the fish and wildlife people get phone, obviously, phone calls. You got to say, you can't let this happen, but fish and wildlife will not, not interfere. Uh, the other thing I was going to say about mating is that it's not unusual for a, a, a long-term couple to be threatened by an aggressor. Uh, a, a male or a female who will come in and try to kill, uh, you know, male might come in and try to kill the, uh, the, the male that's an established relationship. And if, if that happens, the female will take up with that male because that male has demonstrated that he will be, you know, a, a better defender and a, and a provider. But the female 
eagles do have done the same thing too. Have come in and killed other females to take up with, with the man. Um, uh, yes, Jane. Did you see the um, a few years ago? Uh, one of the babies got its legs stuck in the rails of the nest in the mm -hmm. one in DC. Yeah. They sent a climber up to get you them know, down. Take it yeah. Bed. Uh, I didn't see the video of the climber. I saw the video of, of the eaglet with his uh, foot stuck. Yeah. And uh, and so the pressure, the, the fish and wildlife bowed to the pressure in, the, in that case. And uh, and I've seen that nest. I, I visited that nest a couple of years ago, as, as a matter of fact, with uh, um, Carolyn Staub, um, who, uh, who was a UF graduate, PhD, and uh, used to live here and was an old friend. And, you know, it's a good way to see how big they are because that guy was standing up in the nest and then it's ready for another thing. Oh, yeah. I mean, Doris Magger, I mean, the nest he was in is six feet across. And the one that was two tons was eight feet across and 12 feet deep. And it was 35 years old when it, when it crashed. That was in the 1920s. But no, Doris Magger said, uh, uh, somebody asked her how it felt up there and she said, she said, she says, it's great. She said, I, you know, I can stretch out from north to south and have, still have room. And uh, so they're, they're very big nests. Um, maybe one more. We have time for one more. Yes, Caitlin. All right, I've got one more. Okay. Um, in your research, did you find Jean Keen, the Eagle Lady of Homer, now deceased? Uh, yeah, I came across her, but I do not write about her. Yeah, I had my Eagle Lady. At the time, but yes, I did. Yeah, there. I mean, there's there's so much more I could have written about, um, and um, and uh, but I wanted to keep this to about 400 pages, which is not big enough. But uh, there, there are so many people, and there are a number. There are just a number that I haven't mentioned here that are in the book that um, were heroic and dedicated themselves to these birds. Um, I want to say one more thing, and it's a thank you, a special thank you to, to Cynthia Barnett, and she and I have uh, for a long time been referred to ourselves as, as writing partners. We don't co-author together, but we're, we make ourselves available to each other any hour of the day uh, to read each other's work, and uh, Cynthia read this book in its entirety, uh, and it always offers astute observations and comments and she's somebody you know if those of you who write know how important it is to have somebody to read your work and somebody who you can trust and uh, Cynthia has been been that person for me for um, since, uh, the last last two books and just uh, all the other stuff I've, I've written as well in between so uh, and she does just a fantastic introduction doesn't she <laughs> Thank you. I'll be signing out. I'll be signing out at a table outside, sitting next to Willa, uh, trying not to cry. And uh, so I'm happy to sign any books you have, even if you brought a copy of The Gulf or any. And if you brought one of Cynthia's books, I'll sign her book too. <laughs> Thank you so much.